Hi there, and welcome back to Oof! Right in the Childhood. I'm Jen, and this is a podcast where I watch the Disney animated feature films in the order in which they were released, and react to them from a modern standpoint. I absolutely love Disney animated films. I grew up with them, and they have a special place in my heart. But, as I've grown up, my eyes have been opened, and I'm starting to see the not-so-great messages that they inserted into my childhood. Today, I'll be talking about the second film from 1940, Fantasia. At first, I was going to say there are no words because I forgot there were words in this, so instead we'll call this Fantasia, Disney's first acid trip. This is probably the movie my father, a band director, and I disagree on most, in that he loves it and I just do not remember ever liking it one bit. It's my hope that, through a rewatch, I'll get a new appreciation for it, but I'm not holding my breath. But first, some history behind Fantasia. I'm going to do my best not to mispronounce a whole lot of names, but don't at me if I do. Also, as I've done the research for this film, there's a lot of history I didn't know, and it's my longest history portion yet. In fact, it's my longest episode yet, so sit down and get comfortable. In 1936, Mickey Mouse had declined in popularity and Walt Disney had planned a really intricate version of the studio shorts named Silly Symphonies to bring him back. The short was set to the music of The Sorcerer's Apprentice by Paul Dukas. While researching for this episode, I also learned that there's a German poem by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, which details the story in the cartoon. Walt got the rights to the music and was looking for an orchestra and conductor when he met Leopold Stokowski, who conducted the Philadelphia Symphony Orchestra. Stokowski agreed to conduct the piece for free, a decision I'm certain he never regretted once. The short, though, cost the studio $125,000. That's $2.2 million when adjusting for inflation. I mentioned in episode 1 that the original budget for Stone White was $250,000, and that was the same amount as 10 typical Silly Symphonies. So Walt was staring at a short that was five times more expensive than his typical shorts, and this was before he'd even released a full-length movie. But Snow White was on the horizon, and as that movie raked in the profits, Roy O. Disney, the studio's financial manager, realized they couldn't make a profit with The Sorcerer's Apprentice as it was. So the brothers began to plan a full-length feature film with The Sorcerer's Apprentice as its centerpiece. So. Walt called Stokowski and inquired on his contract and its costs. His biggest problem, though, wasn't the symphony, but the recording. At the time that Fantasia was being released, theaters had a single speaker, usually placed behind the screen, and it gave the movie a thin sound that Walt didn't like. He wanted the audience to feel like they were in a concert hall. So he called RCA and asked them if they could help him with a multi-channel recording of the symphony. Their first attempt was with The Sorcerer's Apprentice, and it was terrible for the musicians. They couldn't hear each other, given the way that the recording was set up, and the overall balance went wrong. Eventually, Disney scrapped the idea for The Sorcerer's Apprentice and recorded it on a single track, but he wasn't quite done. When it came time for the recording sessions of the other seven pieces of music, RCA tried again. In July of 1939, with $200,000 in equipment, that's $3.7 million in 2020, they placed 33 separate microphones throughout the orchestra and combined those microphones into eight music tracks and a click track for animators to draw in rhythm with the music. They called this technology Fantasound. In that process, they created a lot of the technology that the program I use to record these podcasts has by default, like Noise cancelling. That didn't exist before Fantasia. In the end, according to Andrew Boone in Popular Science, approximately three million feet of sound film were used for the film's music. Peter Van Gelder said in his book, That's Hollywood, a behind-the-scenes look at 60 of the greatest films of all time, that a fifth of the movie's budget was just music. That budget, by the way, was $2.28 million, or $42 million today. Now that Disney and RCA had created a completely new way to listen to music, they had to show that movie. And that provided more problems because, again, most theaters had one speaker. 
What use was the new Fanta sound if there was only one speaker? In addition, Fantasia clocked in at two hours and five minutes, so they needed to provide an intermission to their patrons. RKO, the distribution company at the time, was afraid that moviegoers wouldn't want to attend a cartoon that was so long. In the end, Fantasia opened at the Broadway Theater in New York City. Walt reserved the theater for an entire year and had his staff install Fanta Sound before the opening day. That took a week. Then, the phone started to ring as people wanted to reserve tickets. According to Neil Gabler in his biography of Walt Disney, they had to hire eight additional telephone operators to keep up with the demand. In the end, Fantasia played the Broadway theater for 57 total weeks, which included 49 consecutive weeks, and that made it the longest-running movie of the time. But Broadway wasn't the only place that would see Fantasia. Walt also organized a roadshow of 12 more theaters around the United States. Each of these theaters received a Fantasound setup and played the movie twice a day. They also brought in Disney-trained ushers to show patrons to their seats, and gave them an illustrated program booklet. By the time the first run had finished, the Broadway theater had made $300,000, or $5.2 million today. And the other 12 road shows had made a combined $1.3 million, or $22.8 million today. Which sounds great, until you realize it cost $85,000 to install Fantasound in a single theater. And that's $1.5 million today. And Walt had leased the theaters. So the movie hadn't made any money. In fact, it had made negative money. Desperate to recoup his costs, Walt finally allowed RKO to distribute the film on their own terms. They cut it down to an hour and 20 minutes and released it to regular theaters in mono sound. The film has gone through several re-edits throughout the years, but in 1946, RKO restored most of the portions they cut and re-released it again at 1 hour 55 minutes. But it still hadn't turned a profit. If that wasn't enough, in 1955, they discovered that the original recordings had started to deteriorate. Quickly, they transferred the recordings over to a three-channel recording to make sure as much as possible could be saved. Walt Disney died in 1966 without Fantasia ever making a profit. But that isn't the end. In 1969, Fantasia returned to theaters with a new ad campaign that focused on psychedelic imagery. And it is with this release that the film began to make a profit for the first time, 29 years after its original release. Unlike most of the Disney movies, there's no compiled number for how much money the movies made over its time. But, when it was re-released for its 50th anniversary, coincidentally, when I saw it for the first time, that release alone brought in $25 million, or $49.3 million today. This podcast is sponsored by my patrons on Patreon. I love creating content for you, and becoming a patron on my Patreon helps me cover hosting fees and upgrade the equipment I use while allowing me to minimize ad time and promote small businesses. For as little as $5 a month, you can access an ad-free version of the podcast. For information on my Patreon, visit my website at oofmychildhood.com. Oof, Right in the Childhood is also sponsored by small businesses. Rather than using giant corporations who are paid by other giant corporations to place their ads in my podcast, I decided I'd rather small businesses have the opportunity to get their amazing products out to my listeners. And if you're listening to this right now, you know this ad spot could work for your small business. Head to oofmychildhood.com and click sponsor an episode to get information on the pricing structure and how it works. I'd love to tell my listeners about your amazing business. All of the following is commentary on the film as I see it now, in 2020. My views are not that of the Disney Company. It appears that I'm watching the original release, as it says it's two hours and six minutes long. Prologue. The movie starts with a real orchestra going to its seats and tuning. Our narrator introduces the whole concept of music, and we'll be starting with music for the sake of music. The Toccata and Fugue in D minor. Okay. 
So as I mentioned, my dad was band director, so I have literally grown up with instrumental music. And Takata and Fugue, though Bach just wrote it because Bach liked writing really complex things, has never been abstract to me. It's very much a dark and stormy castle. We'll blame that on the movie industry's likelihood to use it as a scary backdrop. I do want to know how the sequence was filmed, though. Were there screens that the orchestra was backlit from? Is there a special technique for creating the silhouettes this way? I didn't see anything about the filming of the live-action sequences in my web searches. We move on to murmurations of violin bows flying through the clouds. It's a cool way of integrating them into the abstract portion. Though the strings are our main section for this portion, I feel sad for the other instruments that didn't get animated. Then we move to chemtrails in the clouds and furrowed fields and dizzying furrowed fields. And at one point we have a rock or cloud formation that's very similar to the shape of Triton's castle in The Little Mermaid. What's it called when something is reminiscent of another thing that was created decades later? Probably happenstance. The Nutcracker Suite Our narrator talks about how Tchaikovsky hated the Nutcracker Suite. It's worth mentioning that Tchaikovsky also hated the 1812 Overture, so maybe he had to hate his own work to make it popular? We start with the dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy, and we have fairies. Fairies that I'm going to pretend are not naked. They're naked. They make the world beautiful at night. Then they end up decorating a spider web. The dew falls down onto his toadstools who dance the Chinese dance, or tea. And, oof, right in the childhood, they are absolutely racist depictions of Chinese people with their wide-brimmed hats, slanted eyes, and their hands put together as they walk, and they bow. Holy crap. Well, at least it's over quickly. On to the dance of the flutes, which is made up of flowers. Dancing. But then they turn inside out and they're wearing ball gowns. And from a botanist's point of view, they're sticking their reproductive organs up in the air. But I've just decided to be okay with that. The Arabian dance, coffee, starts underwater. Some of the most beautiful goldfish reside here. They wear a lot of eye makeup and have transparent fins. I wonder if these are inspired by stereotypical belly dance wear. According to my research, they did bring in an Arabian dancer for them to study her movement for this fish. All in all, they're less offensive than the mushrooms, but that's not a high bar. Thistles! They dance the Russian dance, Trepok. Aren't thistles traditionally Scottish? My daughter did point out that their tops look a lot like Cossack hats, and that's valid. We're back to the fairies for the Waltz of the Flowers. Now it's autonomal fairies that turn the world gold for the fall. They release little cotton dancing girls into the air, and they're just so cute. They even have little arms, and they do that swan lake fall down thing that ballerinas do. And it's time for winter fairies, and there's snowflakes! As I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, this ended up being my longest recording yet, so I've decided to break it into two parts. Join me next Monday as we start with The Sorcerer's Apprentice. This episode's cover art is provided by Shaw Shaw. You can find more of her art on her Instagram. I linked to that over on the show's website at oofmychildhood.com. If you'd like to provide cover art for a future episode, head over to the website. We have a form to submit art as well as the details for what the requirements are. Just click Submit Your Art to have your piece considered for a future episode. Our theme music was composed and played by Sean Rudolph of Let Music Be. For more information on that studio, you can visit their website at letmusic.be or visit my website for an easy link. Transcripts are edited and finalized by Melissa Wilmot. You can find transcripts for each episode on my website, and if you check out my YouTube channel, I have captioned video versions of each episode as they're published. I do my best to provide YouTube videos and transcripts at the same time as the podcast is released, but if this one isn't up yet, you can always check on my website for an update and a link to the appropriate video. Thank you so much for joining me for Oof! Right in the Childhood. I hope you come back to discuss Disney through modern eyes. This podcast is written, recorded, and edited by me.
I release a new episode every Monday through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and many, many other podcatchers. If you liked this episode, please leave a rating and review wherever you're listening to the show. That helps people find the show. Also, join me on social media. You can search for OOF, Right in the Childhood, on Facebook or Twitter, and my Twitter handle is OOF My Childhood. You can also email me at oofmychildhood at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you.